thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, of course, a special uh, thanks and welcome to Keith, Keith Martin. Uh, so Keith is a managing director of the Centre for Eye Research in, in Melbourne. Uh, and you'll know that we've done a number of collaborative projects with CIRA uh, over the years. He's also Ringland Anderson Professor and Head of Ophthalmology at the University of Melbourne, uh, specialises in medical and surgical management of complex glaucoma. And, and this, presume this is still current, Keith can correct me, currently president of the World Glaucoma Association. And uh, I've heard uh, Keith uh, talk a little bit about his experiences to date uh, in terms of bedside, uh, sorry, bench to bedside translation. And I think it's very relevant uh, to everyone that I can see on the screen here today. It's obviously something that, that we're passionate about trying to do. Uh, on a number of fronts. So it's, it's great that uh, Keith was able to, to join us today and share his experiences with us. So special welcome, Keith, and uh, looking forward to your presentation and, and the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to share my screen and make sure you can all see, see that side of things as well. Uh, great. So I hope you can see that. And um, I guess, uh, Gordon and I uh, took part in a session in uh, St. Vincent's recently, and we were both uh, talking about different aspects of the sort of translational journey. And, uh, and so the, I guess my talk here today sort of stems from that. Um, and so I, 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 a couple of disclaimers. I'm a clinician scientist. Um, I know very little about electromaterial science, if anything. Um, and uh, I'm certainly no expert on commercialization. I've got no training, no qualifications, um, uh, and most of my research probably has no commercial value whatsoever. But uh, I'm interested in translation. Um, I want my research to achieve real world impact. And uh, I've had a few experiences along the way, which I'll share with you today, about trying to make things um, happen in the, in the real world. Um, and uh, I say no expert, but uh, Gordon was keen to, to share a bit of the, the story um, and then obviously always keen to explore new opportunities for collaboration. And that's uh, often, you know, being a bit out of your comfort zone with a group of people working on some different things is where the major opportunities uh, arise. So, so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about why um, commercialize your research. And this is a, a bit of a sort of evangelism that we're doing within CIRA and, um, and also within the University of Melbourne at the moment. I'm trying to push, um, so certainly in the Department of Surgery, um, um, there, there's a bit of work to do to actually get some of the people who are not engaging with this pr process to, to think about it earlier in the course of their work. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of my own sort of personal journey. So, so in terms of, you know, why commercialize your, your research? I, I don't tend to talk about commercialization very much. I talk about impact, real world impact from what you're trying to do. And there are different ways of uh, achieving that. And it's different for different types of project. But um, for a lot of big projects, partnering in some shape or form is the only way to get big projects done. And that may involve licensing deals or spin out companies or various different things. But, but unless you um, you know, are willing to sort of partner and step outside the this, this standard sort of grant funding way of doing things, then, then some big projects are, 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 are out of reach. Um, I, I think what I've learned along the, the way is that it's a great way to broaden your network of contacts. You get to talk to a lot of smart people and investors, external experts, people in industry. And, and I, I find that the most interesting in a lot of ways, part of the whole process was, was actually just talking to a wider range of smart people who, who work in fields outside of your own. Um, and you sometimes feel find in a, in a field like, you know, ophthalmology or even in a smaller area like glaucoma where I work, you, you, you find you're sitting around with the same people at conferences saying the same things to each other for years on end. And it's nice to shake it up a bit and talk to people who've got completely different different expertise and experience. And so I, I've, I've certainly enjoyed that, that aspect. Um, and of course, there's the opportunity to generate revenue for your research, to support your own research, or you know, for whatever else you want to use it for. So it all starts with an unmet need. And in my case, that was related to the optic nerve in glaucoma. Um, so, and uh, the optic nerve is the nerve that connects your eye to your brain. Um, and it's a bundle, sort of like a sort of fiber optic cable, if you like, of about a million and a half nerve fibers that wire your eye back into the visual centers in the brain. And 
what happens in glaucoma is that you get um, a progressive biomechanical deformation to the point where the optic nerve leaves the back of the eye. So it's vulnerable mechanically at that point. Uh, the eye is moving around the whole time, the pressure's going up and down, all this sort of stuff is acting uh, in terms of force at the optic nerve head, and sometimes it doesn't cope with that very well. Uh, and what happens in that situation is you get this progressive, what we call cupping or deformation of the optic nerve head associated with loss of the nerve fibers. So the picture in pink on the top left, it's got lots of healthy nerve fibers, the big gaping sort of cavity in the middle on the right is what happens in advanced glaucoma and that picks off your, your vision. So you lose the vision and this is a representation of what people can see at different stages of the disease. On the left, just the normal blind spot. Um, the center of the cross is the center of their vision and you can see by the time they get to the right, they're missing a lot of the world. Um, and, uh, and they're often not aware of it. So the, the brain does a pretty good job of trying to integrate what, are, what becomes a fairly grainy picture it integrates it over space and time and so builds up a picture that, that is probably better than its actual resolution um, but um, the, um, the damage is done and the damage is irreversible once it has been done um, and so what we're really trying to do is to pre prevent this from happening so that was the and in terms of glaucoma we've got pretty successful treatments this is a major problem uh, worldwide and it's getting commoner as we all live longer um, and um, it remains the commonest cause of irreversible blindness in the world. Um, currently, the only thing we can do is lower the pressure in the eye. So we give them eye drops to do operations or fire lasers at the eye to reduce the pressure. Um, but the unmet need is that a, up to 15% go blind in at least one eye, despite access to the best available treatments. And so that's, from my point of view, uh, my, my research is focused on how we um, prevent those 15% of, of, of blind eyes. And so uh, I'll, I won't go into a huge amount of details about, the, about the, the, the science, but I've been interested in taking gene therapy approaches to this for the best part of the last 20 years, uh, initially at Johns Hopkins in the US where I did my postdoc time. And right back in 2000, and, well, between 2000 and 2003, we had developed uh, a gene therapy vector that could improve the survival of the optic nerve uh, when exposed to uh, glaucoma in animal models of the disease. And so we could rescue almost 40% of ganglion cells um, using this vector. And how this vector works is it, it, it um, contains the gene for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And that's something that's very important to the survival of retinal ganglion cells, which are the nerve cells that make up the optic nerve. And so, so we got pretty excited about this. We did the, the usual route and we, we um, um, did, did a series of experiments and published them and put it out there um, and, um, and showed that this could give a short-term benefit. Problem was it didn't, the effect didn't last very long. Glaucoma is a chronic disease. You can have glaucoma for decades. Um, this treatment only worked for a, for a week or two in, in terms of protecting the, the nerve. So, so not useful as a long-term solution. And, um, and at that stage, the other, you know, when we talk to people about, you know, can, can we turn this into a treatment? Well, it doesn't work for long enough. Nobody's going to tolerate injections into the eye. That was the other thing that came up, believe it or not. I spend half of the entire budget for ophthalmology at the Eye Ear Hospital on, on injecting stuff into people's eyes now, a few years down the line. But uh, there was a period where that was seen as unacceptable and patients wouldn't tolerate it. Um, and, and the other thing was that we didn't know, you know, whether it could, uh, protect function uh, in the eye as well. And so, so I moved on and moved on to working more on, on stem cells and other things at that stage. Um, and, and I'd love to tell you that the whole, you know, commercial journey post that was all my idea. It wasn't at all. I got cold called by this guy. Uh, his name is Peter Whittison, and he had held senior positions in research and development with Pfizer and AstraZeneca and uh, Sanofi and, and was at that time working for Oxford Biomedica running their gene therapy program for rare diseases, developing rare um, gene therapies for rare single gene diseases. And he, he called me and said, look, you did this work 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Why didn't you take it forward? You know, what's, what's the problem? Um, and um, was, his interest was in, in developing gene therapy for common diseases. So rather just having from a handful of common diseases, can you use the same technology to treat um, um, common 
um, diseases like glaucoma, like macular degeneration, like diabetic retinopathy. And so we sat down and, and, and tried to hammer out what the problems were with the previous um, viruses that we'd been working on um, and realized that, you know, there, it was actually conceptually pretty simple. We needed to come over this, get over this problem that when you just give this brain derived neurotrophic factor um, to ganglion cells over time, they sort of lose interest in it. So originally it's very protective. Um, but they become resistant to it over time. Um, and that's due to a process called uh, receptor down regulation. So the, the number of uh, receptors on the cell surface goes down and therefore the BDNF has less effect. But if we wanted to do something that overcomes that, we would have to put more than just BDNF into the construct. We would have to do something to overcome that down, re down regulation. And what we wanted to put in was the BDNF receptor. So we wanted to give both the BDNF but also the BDNF receptor to upregulate signaling within the cell in the, in the long term, with the idea that if we trickled this receptor into the membrane, we could keep the, the cells, the nerve cells, listening to this BDNF signal for a much longer time. And obviously we had to demonstrate that it was safe and, uh, and it worked long term. So, so this is the last bit of detail for a while, which I, again, I won't dwell on, but really what we, want to, what we did in the back of an envelope initially, and then through a series of... Um, de developing plasmids and, and constructs was how to squish both the, the TREK B receptor for brain derived neurotrophic factor and BDNF itself and everything else you need into the limited packaging capacity of an AAV2. So, so gene therapy is a bit like writing tweets or text messages. You've only got a certain number of characters you can use. Uh, and after, if you exceed that, you can't send it or it can't be, it can't be interpreted. Um, and so we spent a, a, a couple of years um, working on a whole range of different designs until we eventually managed to get something which would fit into into um, uh, into Trek B and and was starting to show some promise in in animal models. So we had about thirty constructs. We've we've now got fifty two different constructs that we've tried in various types of um, experiment. So so what happened next? Well, this is where the sort of commercialization aspect of it began because uh, we realized it was going to be really hard to get the where we wanted with with getting this through the clinical trial stage with um, with grant funding alone. And um, and so what we did was we were encouraged by um, Cambridge Enterprise, which is the, the tech transfer arm of the University of Cambridge to spin out a company from the lab. Um, and, and they uh, helped us do that. We were on a shoestring pretty much to do that. You can tell by the quality of the logo, which we, we, we drew ourselves. We were still, still slightly embarrassed by it to this day, but we found a company called Quithera. Um, and uh, this was completely uncharted territory for me. I had, I had no idea what this process involved, but before we knew it, we, we, we had a, a board of directors. Um, so Cambridge Enterprise put a rep on there. We had a little bit of funding from Innovate UK, um, which supports sort of startup companies in the UK. Uh, we had Peter, who was the, you know, had the, the senior pharma experience and biotech experience. And we had me as sort of chief scientific officer and, uh, you know, a couple of postdocs working in my lab, working on the project as well. Um, and that's all we had at, 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 at startup. Um, before we knew it, we had you know monthly board meetings, which was just a shock. Monthly technical reports, which was more of a shock, in terms of having to deliver you know reports every month to the board on the progress. And so you know this was all stuff that I was not expecting. And then and then having to shift from aiming for the standard grant funding to raising seed funding into the company again again all stuff which I was had no real familiarity with. And so you know we, in the early days we, we, I was very very tempted to, to to give up on this because it was yeah I, I felt it was sort of hitting some of the other things that i was trying to do on the university side and um and um if it hadn't been for a little bit of extra funding that came through from the innovation and science seed fund um to help us with some of the patent costs and a little bit of funding from from cambridge enterprise i think we'd have we'd have given up on it so so again it was a little bit of just in time funding that helped um and uh, uh, so a little bit Later than that, once we, we'd got some of that done, um, we, we did actually pull in a bit more seed funding. Not a lot. It was about um, um, initially it was just a couple of hundred thousand pounds um, to, to keep the work going and to, to help us um, protect some of the some of the, the, the work that we'd already done. And this 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 was money that was raised as the first money that came into to Quithera itself, the company. Um, and using that, we worked to develop 
um, a combined gene therapy that gave both the BDNF and its receptor, and were able to demonstrate that it was very effective at protecting retinal ganglion cells in animal models um, of, of, of glaucoma. And again, I won't bore you the details. The more red dots, the better. Um, and we could rescue about 70% of the red dots, which are ganglion cells, so we could protect about 70% of the nerve from dying off um, in the context of severe um, glaucoma. So, so that was the, 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 the pilot stage, and, and, and that led us sort of pretty much into this sort of valley of death sort of situation where we were, we were having to pay quite a lot to do this research. We were running off a very limited amount of funding, and we hadn't got anybody on board to take it, you know, to fund taking it to the next step. Um, so again, a pretty, pretty sort of anxious time. We were rescued again, just in the nick of time by, by the Wellcome Trust who have some no strings attached pathfinder grants to do boring research. Um, and the boring research they, they like to fund here uh, is, is research that de-risks projects. So, so, so in other words, we had one candidate at this time and, and they told us, no, you, you need more, you need more candidates because that one falls over, you need a, something else. And so, and so they helped fund us to broaden out the research program to, um, so that we didn't have all the eggs in one basket and, and it gave us a little bit more funding to keep going with no or very few strings, strings attached. Uh, and then it was a case, again, I did not have any idea what I was getting myself into with, with a small startup company about how much work you have to do to try and get yourselves in front of people. And, and it was so entering competitions and, and applying for, for you know, startup grants and, 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 and going to showcases and all this, all this sort of stuff that, you know, again, it, you know, so we did, you know, in, in the course of that year, we did about 11 uh, showcases. Uh, we were lucky enough to be um, runners up in the UK synthetic biology competition, which helped because that got us in front of a lot of potential investors. And we won a couple of other awards during that time. But, but you know, we, we, we spent a lot of time in front of venture funds and pharma companies and telling the story. And, you know, again, I was, I was getting really pretty frustrated that this was never going to go anywhere. And I think in terms of learnings, a few of the things I've picked up along the way where, you know, this is hugely time consuming. Um, things move much faster than academia. Um, it's really important to protect your IP early in the process. Um, I find that some of my publications got delayed as well. I mean, they don't they get delayed rather than cancelled, but um, but it does mean your academic output can take a hit temporarily, and then it catches up later. And I think I think it, it was just a delay, certainly in my case. Um, you learn a bit about the process of what industry is interested in when they come to look at something down the line, because the um, the process of due diligence is a, is a pretty uh, interesting experience the first time you go through it. Um, and, and you realize how important it is that you document and timestamp absolutely everything uh, along the line and uh, are able to demonstrate, you know, what, what, what is happening. And, uh, you know, most people don't get back to you. And, uh, and we certainly learned you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find the find the prince, as it were. Um, we were we were lucky we did eventually find a fit and um off the back of a total amount of seed funding that went in of about half a million pounds we 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 did reach a deal with uh Astellis, which is a, a big japanese uh pharma company um for for about 160 million um australian dollars uh, at that time uh, obviously milestone related and uh and, and, and certainly not all paid up as yet as this project um, uh, still progresses with them, but it's moving now towards clinical trials and it's an advanced preclinical development with, um, um, with Astellis uh, now, um, which, is, which is good. And we're still working with them quite closely. Um, another learning point that it would never have occurred to me, but Peter with his industry background said, well, we're not giving Astellis everything. And, and before we um, um, sold that, that company, we carved out another one um, called Acaravec to do gene therapy development for other diseases other than glaucoma. Um, so working on uh, macular degeneration and uh, working on uh, diabetic macular edema. And this, that company is now um, still running in, in Babraham. So we still have, we completed a seed round um, uh, last year. Uh, we're raising some money into that and uh, are, are hoping to bring clinical trials for the lead candidate for this one to Australia, to, to Melbourne down the line as well. So we're already talking about that because we've got a really great infrastructure in Melbourne now for giving gene therapies to humans. Um, so we've, we've treated, this is out of date now, we've now treated five patients so far in 2021. Uh, I saw one of them this morning uh, in phase two studies of a new gene therapy for, for macular degeneration. Uh, we've got in-house therapies developing for, and, and we've got three more clinical trials 
um, that are starting later on in the year, again, doing human gene therapy. So, so we're trying to build up quite a bit of capacity and capability there as well. Um, so that's just what, you know, I, I, on my gene therapy stuff, I'll just give you a very quick um, idea of a couple of the other things that are going on at CIRA. Uh, at the moment, we've been, we've been busy. Um, I, our, and, and what I've been trying to do is bring more of a, 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 a culture of um, um, sort of, you know, the, the, the sort of startup culture to, to CIRA a little bit as well. So, uh, we sold our first startup uh, earlier on this year. That was called Oculo. That uh, is a company that... Um, uh, is a software platform for communication between ophthalmology and uh, optometry, um, which is uh, from a standing start taking over 70% of the market in Australia and New Zealand. And, uh, and uh, so we sold that um, to a Finnish company, um, which is taking it on um, and, and hopefully going to make it even even better platform. We use this still in our, our research for connecting up rural and remote and uh, optometrists for our clinical studies as well. Um, but that was our first. Um, our next spin-out, which has just recently uh, emerged from CIRA, is, is called Enlightened Imaging. Um, uh, and that's being headed up by Peter Van Weingarten and, and Xavier Hadou. So Xavier is a, uh, an, an engineer who uh, spent his uh, the, the, the first part of his career working on uh, hyperspectral imaging of crops from space, uh, looking to detect how healthy crops were from very subtle differences in color. And um, and uh, Peter recruited him to work on a project, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment. We're this, this is our, our our little board uh, at the moment as well. Um, and and what we're trying to do is to develop a hyperspectral imaging camera that detects Alzheimer's disease years before any cognitive decline. Uh, and this is based on the idea that there's a spectral signature of a substance called amyloid in the retina. Amyloid is the junk that accumulates in your brain when you got Alzheimer's disease. Uh, by the time you've accumulated a lot of Alzheimer's amyloid in your brain, it's probably too late to treat you with drugs because the brain's wrecked. But what has, we've noticed is that amyloid accumulates in the retina too at a stage where it does it much earlier than it uh, damages the vision. And you can pick it up with this hyperspectral scan. There's a, a spectral signature. And so the idea of this project is to develop a two second scan that detects uh, people who are potentially treatable with drugs to modify the course of Alzheimer's disease. Um, when there's still a chance to protect them from going demented. Um, and uh, so we're already at the stage where we're, we're beating the gold standard for diagnosis at the moment, which is really expensive PET scanning um, and invasive tests like, like lumbar puncture. Um, and so this is a, a, a project which we're, we're pretty excited about. Um, so really, I'll, I'll leave it there. I, Gordon, you told me 25 minutes or so, so that's, um, that's what I've done. Leave time for questions. And, um, but just in summary, I think you know, commercialization is a way for certain types of project, not every project, but certain types of uh, research project to achieve a real world impact. Um, I think it, it's really important to think about the possibilities early uh, and use expert advice locally. I didn't think about the possibilities early. I was lucky and somebody called me. Um, but 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 certainly for future reference and with other projects, I'm, I'm you know I'm definitely trying to think earlier and encouraging other people to think earlier. And it's uh, you know it's 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 sort of hard work, but um, I, I think it's uh, it's it, it's worth it. So so I'll I'll, I'll leave it there um, and uh, I'll stop sharing and uh, happy to take any any questions. Great, thanks for that, Keith. Uh, pretty uh, amazing journey. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, you can either put your hand up or stick it in the chat, or uh, there's not too many of us on screen. We've got about 37 or so, 40, so uh, you can turn your microphone off and uh, you can ask a question. So I'll, I'll just kick it off. Uh, Keith, you, you, you mentioned the impact on, on yourself, uh, and, and in the long run, of course, it was a, it turns out to be quite a positive impact. Could you comment on the impact on some of the, the younger researchers, many of whom we have on screen here, like you mentioned the postdocs and, and the experience for them? Yeah, so the, so the, um, so I recruit, the postdoc I recruited who did most of the early work on this project came from a, a you know, purely sort of academic background and all, all, all the rest of it. And, um, and he's loved the journey as well. We, we made him, a, you made sure that he was part of the company from the start. So, so he, you know, he had shares in the company from the outset. He was motivated to, to work on the, on, on the project. He's now the chief scientific officer of the second company, so a Caravac, uh, he, and he's moved you know, out of the university sector and into that. 
the other PhD students that I've had in Cambridge are half and half. Half of them are sort of, you know, interested in pursuing careers in academia or so, or 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 something unrelated to science potentially, and and the other half are they all want their own um, piece of the, the the biotech, you know, entrepreneurship sort of thing. And maybe that's the sort of people who who, who came to me. But they, you know, they're all interested in, in their own sort of spin out ideas or working with startup companies and so you know i, I think it's it's changing as a, as a as a career i think there are far more opportunities now as a as a uh, as a you know phd student as a postdoc of the sort of things you can do you're not committed to just necessarily work i shouldn't say this at a university but you're not committed to working within a university for the rest of your career but also you can move you know there is the opportunity to work simultaneously in different sectors and i think more universities are becoming open to the fact that they have academics who are you know particularly younger academics coming through will have different feet in different you know different camps i think it's really healthy um you know and i think you know th th there's a real opportunity f f here to improve the, the the lives of you know postdocs and phd students rather than having this absolutely terrible career structure where you've got you know a load of people at the bottom and this this pyramid was just a tiny number of people at the top you've got so many different things you can do now um in in, in biotech and i think it's really exciting and um and uh, I think there are huge opportunities. So, so you know, th there was a phase a few years ago when I said, well, well why would anybody want to do biomedical science? It's such a terrible career structure. You're mercy of grants the whole time, all the rest of it. But, but now, you know, I think there, there are more and more opportunities. It's a really exciting space. Um, and, you know, there are people around who can actually facilitate your getting stuff done and getting it out into the real world in the way that there weren't in the past. You're not just dependent on, you know, the, the 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 luck of the draw with whichever tech transfer officer in your university you know is assigned to the case universities are getting smarter research institutes are getting smarter about how they support people um and 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 there's much more support in the in the you know in the wider biomedical research community now than i think was in the past i think that's so you know i, I i'm i'm much more encouraging again now to you know phd students and the rest of it are thinking about doing this um and you know and i think they'll, they'll they'll probably do it better than us i had no idea no idea no idea what how the process worked and i think at the very least the guys in the phd students in the lab have seen what the process is like firsthand and so have a bit of an understanding about what, what it's what it's like even if they they're watching you visibly age in front of them <laughs> and enjoying it i'm sure uh, and, and uh, yeah, I totally agree with you, Keith. And I think the the other exciting thing that's happening is that uh, universities, well, at least some of the more enlightened ones, are, are starting to appreciate the value of that experience, even for people that come back into the into the research or university environment. Don't you think? Yeah. yeah, I think that's absolutely right. You know, and also the fun bit is the is the multidisciplinary aspect of it. You know, as as part of this project i've been interfacing with you know en engineers physicists you know some some computational mathematics was required for some of the stuff and you know the stuff i'd never have dreamed of getting in in involved with and um you know so it's been great from that point of view and um and i say it doesn't harm the sort of academic side it's just it's just delays it a bit sometimes that's the that's the the thing yeah, you're a brave man. Keep getting involved with engineers, but anyhow. Uh, so, Alex, do you want to uh, turn on your mic? And uh... they're not as bad as physicists, Gordon. I had physicists <laughs> ask me why you ever needed to do an experiment more than once. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to touch the physicists, but I got a bit of a background there. <laughs> uh, he's got a noisy dog. Hey, Keith, can you read that question in the in the chat? It's rather long for me to. Yeah. A few questions on gene therapy. How does your gene therapy compare to, yeah, for the RP65? Okay, so I can answer that. The optogenetics gene for retinitis pigmentosa may have limited variable gene expression across the retina. The risk of immune response limits each patient to one injection. Are you able to ensure gene therapy across the whole retina? Um, the risk of immune response is unknown. Yeah, all good questions. Um, uh, ethically, we've argued that all trials use the same serotypes patient risk yeah good, good question so so um so our therapy there, there are two there are two broad ways in which you can use gene therapy you can either use it to well more now but you can either use it to replace a missing gene so in other words you have somebody with a single gene defect um and they they don't produce that gene you replace that gene and you improve the the outlook for that patient 
And that's what is happening with the RP65 treatments. The first licensed gene therapy in Australia and Europe and US is called Luxterna. And, uh, and that is a treatment for this rare RP65 um, disease. Um, uh, and in fact, I was in discussions with Novartis this morning because we're still haggling over the, the time course of how to deliver that to patients in, um, uh, in, in Australia. Because the, and so your point is, is, is well made about the potential for um, uh, sort of uh, reactions to the patient. So the, um, so the difference approach that we're using for glaucoma is to use a gene that doesn't replace a missing gene, but enhances a protective pathway. And so that's a different sort of model of doing this. In terms of being able to target the whole retina um, or, the, or all of the retinal ganglion cells, Certainly in animal models, we can achieve up to 80%. Um, now you can say, well, animal models are not a good reflection of what's gonna happen in humans. And so perhaps the best evidence in humans is the results of another, well, two phase three clinical studies looking at uh, targeting retinal ganglion cells, which is the same cells that we're targeting with a gene therapy in a condition called Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. And this is a rare mitochondrial disease. So the little batteries that power the cells fail because of a missing gene um, and you can replace that gene and in the phase three clinical trials there was a beneficial effect on vision and so that's a more concrete example that using this sort of therapy in in a, in a human you can actually get a benefit as to the long-term risks of using aev2 and repeated doses of aev2 we have looked at this and others have looked at this because it's, it's a very important question about whether you can retreat but also it's not an all or none thing. So there are potentially opportunities to, um, uh, a lot of the immune response is in the immediate aftermath of the treatment. And for example, in the study I talked about, um, the phase three studies, they used a, some systemic steroids around the time of the dose um, to reduce that inflammation. And in the studies that they've done looking at redosing, um, again, they've used steroid and that has damped down that immune um, response. So, so the, 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 there are, but I, I completely take the point, there are issues with immune response. There may be better ways than AV2 vectors to, to, to do this and to do this reprogramming. We're looking at mRNA approaches and other approaches as well that may supersede the use of AV2, particularly when you need to retreat. It's a moving, it's a moving field at the moment. Um, the moment our treatment we're, we're, we're developing as a, as a, as a one-off treatment rather than a retreatment. But there are very much issues with Luxterna about the treatment interval for the two eyes. In fact, Novartis insists that you have to retreat, you have to treat both eyes with, with 40 days and that's part of the approval. Um, and we're arguing at the moment with uh, the, the Australian regulatory authorities at the moment, because we're saying what if the patient doesn't decide they then don't want the, the um, the, the second treatment, or they want to wait and see after the first treatment. The current position from the Australian government is they want to wait and see beyond that 40 days, they've got to pay for the treatment themselves. And given that's $850,000 or whatever, that's a, that's a bit of an ask. But that's, that puts it in context. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Are there any other questions, either on the technical side or the, the non-technical side for, for Keith at the moment? If not, I've just got one, Keith, to, to, to round us off. And others keep putting them in the chat if you've got anything. But you mentioned that it was kind of accidental uh, that you uh, stumbled into or got that uh, lucky call from your acquaintance. Uh, so in terms of making it less accidental going forward, uh, what, what sort of structure or strategy would you recommend to put in place? I think it's just about talking early to whoever's there to support you on the tech transfer side, you know, and, um, you know, the first time around I did it, I just did, it, I just published everything. It didn't, didn't hold anything back. Um, you know, just did it the conventional route. And now I know that, you know, if, if we've got a, something that's looking promising, uh, we talked to our in-house team here and say, look, you know, can we have a look at this? Um, at Sierra, we put a bit of money towards initial IP searches and that sort of thing for people that have got, you know, a bit of an idea just to just to have a look at really basic things like freedom to operate you know if somebody's got an idea um then it, it doesn't cost that much to go out and get a get a patent attorney to have a quick look around at what's out there um and and give you a report you know that will either say look you know it looks like there's something in this that's novel and inventive or or there's 15 other people with patents that are going to be all over you if you try to do this and you know so I, i've certainly realized it's it's well worth doing that 
at an earlier stage than would ever have occurred to to me and that's probably the biggest piece of advice is to talk to people early before you've blabbed on about the stuff at conferences before you've published it um and um and uh, you know d d don't don't give the whole game away and in, in public before you, you've had a chance to talk to to people about you know whether you need to protect some of it okay okay thanks uh look if other people have got questions uh Keith, you probably wouldn't mind if they drop you an email or something no, no worries no for sure yeah so please do that and uh on behalf of everyone keith just a huge thanks i i think it's a a really interesting journey and i think the more examples we we learn of like this the more we can all learn and just do it better the the next go around so thanks for sharing it all with us and uh all the best with the ventures going forward.